Right, I thanks, Darren. I think that's enough. Okay. Here's your wine. Add that to the list. Let everyone thank Darren for his speech. Okay, the next session is making uh, is a marina design, making the best use of your marina assets. Um, so we've got uh, Jason Bradford from uh, the Department of Transport WA. Um, just a, an intro on Jason. The Department of Transport WA plans, delivers, maintains key coastal infrastructure on the WA coastline, providing senior planning project officer Jason with extensive experience in most exciting and challenging environments over the past 10 years. Um, Jason has a diploma in civil and structural engineer and he's been undertaking comp comprehensive research investigation, feasibility and other studies into current and future needs for small craft maritime facilities around WA, ensuring the state's 100,000 recreational boaters and the long established commercial fleet is well catered for. Currently Jason is working on planning for the Woodman Point Marine Precinct, which is a highly important site within Perth's southwest metropolitan area, which will support the growth and future demand for the boat launching, boat storage and a range of complementary maritime service businesses. This will make Woodman Point the largest rec recreational boating facility in WA. They always do things big in WA, don't they? They always say they do anyway. Um, to come and talk about another big facility, I understand. Um, please welcome uh, Jason Bradford. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, coming from the government sector, after Darren's speech makes me feel a bit like a bad guy, but um, we do things can be different there. So, um, yeah, so I want to talk about. Um, Augusta, um, basically it's a community-driven project. Um, and um, I'm going to discuss, uh, do an introduction about um, DOT and um, why we're about about Augusta, the site options and selection, the um, site investigations, the planning and the outcomes. So DOT is a, DOT's role in WA government is to plan, approve and provide public maritime facilities, including public boat harbours um, around the state where there is a recognised need and support. The department has built and manages 16 public boat harbours and 14 major public boating facilities around the state. Design conditions for the harbours range from cyclonic storms and high tides in excess of 10 metres in the north to um, typical winter storms and low tides in the south. The boat harbours are located along the state's 12,500 kilometre coastline. So why a boat harbour at Augusta? So, boat harbour at Augusta is required to provide the necessary protection to enable safe uh, commercial and recreational boating access to the very rough coastline. Augusta is a safe haven between Bustleton, which is 100 kilometres to the north, and Albany, which is about 300 kilometres to the south. So I'll give you a bit of history. So, <clears throat> excuse me. The old Flinders Bay jetty was located at the uh, site of the first settlement in 18, 1830. And Flinders Bay was predominantly a winter port for whaling ships and for the export, in timber, sorry, export of timber. It was officially proclaimed a port in 1855, but sadly in 1913 it closed when the lo local timber industry ended due to fire. And in 1932, a large portion was broken up in a storm. The Blackwood River, is, Blackwood River flows directly into Flinders Bay and is located a couple of kilometres along the coast. The Blackwood River Community, sorry, Blackwood River Commercial Facility was predominantly established for the fishing fleet. But by the early 2000s, the river mouth had silted up, as, thus preventing boating access to the ocean, and dredging was not a sustainable option. The fishing fleet started using mooring lines and loading of product and fuel on the beach, which in turn caused environmental and safety issues. Many vessels broke their lines and ended up washed ashore. The emerging abalone aquaculture industry resulted in a conflict of users at the Flinders Bay boat ramp, resulting in safety, safety issues and poor production. The boat ramp was used by swimmers, aquaculture, recreational boaters, and uh, charter boats tenders. On some days you would see a concrete block, as you can see there, or <clears throat> as the abalone people call it, an habitat, which is a play on the words for abalonian habitat, being loaded while there's recreational fishing people, boaters departing, 
and the same time you'll have a tender boat returning from a well watch, successfully whale watching, to drop off um, passengers. Can you imagine the issues that would cause for the community? Some site op options and selection. So in 1995, primary studies were prepared in response to the difficulties created by the shelling of the Blackwood River entrance. In 2003, the Augusta Maritime Project Coordination Committee was formed, consisting of community representatives, stakeholders, and key user groups. DOT was a technical lead and investigated seven sites. Three of them in the Blackwood River, which is, um, I don't know which one it is, the pointer, that one. So those three there, that's the Blackwood River. And then the other four are in Flinders Bay with direct ocean access. So, sorry, so the Blackwood River had its constraints because the river mouth would have to be trained because of siltation. In 2005, after a two-year period of public consultation, which included a public submission period, advertising, and an information session, which resulted in Flat Rock overwhelmingly, sorry, Flat Rock receiving overwhelming community support as a preferred site. It provided the opportunity for quarrying, on, quarrying of rock on site, which ended up saving about $25 million. This excludes the noise and nuisance that would cause transporting rock through the town and the additional cost of repairing damaged roads. It had the lowest capital cost and also <clears throat> satisfied DOT's key, uh, sorry, key objectives. <clears throat> so site investigations and concept refinement. This took place over four years. Coastal and geotechnical investigations were undertaken with most of these sites undertaken in-house and this provided another substantial saving. Environmental investigations and referrals identified a few issues. There was a declared rare flora, which resulted in a significant realignment of the uh, harbour footprint. Noise management was required while blasting, so it did not impact the passing whales. As a matter of fact, there was no blasting allowed between May and October. And it also identified seagrass meadows, which requires continual monitoring. So planning for community and boater needs. As you can see from this list, there's a <clears throat> wide variety of boater users, from fishing, aquaculture, recreational, charters, and recreational and also trailable vessels, and pen vessels, both power and sailing, <coughs> excuse me. Transient mariners that are traveling up and down the state, and obviously emergency services. A community reference and stakeholder group, sorry, wrong, wrong one. A, government a governance structure was developed that, facil facil that facilitated community and boater use feedback directly with a stakeholder group. This ensured that these groups had a voice in guiding planning, sorry, in the guiding planning and design of the construction. The community reference and stakeholder group had a wish list. This consist consisted of, but was not limited to, boat ramps with fixed or floating jetties, a land back wharf, boat pens, public toilets and pen holders amenities, a jinker ramp and the ability to accommodate visiting cruise ships. This is our smallest boat harbour, which consists of about two and a half hectares of water space and two and a half hectares of land. Our largest harbour, which is Hillary's, just north of Perth, this, that, that consists of 25 hectares of water space and 24 hectares of land. So in this very small harbour, we're able to include a full range of different uses that would normally go into a much larger harbour. As a matter of fact, we achieved 95% of the initial wish list. There were two lots of expressions of interest that were held. The boat pen demand obtained the numbers and size of the vessels, which helped determine the pen distribution and the waterways layout. Sorry? Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Oh, it's okay. Um, so the land development demand um, assisted with the refinement of the concept plans for the lot layout and establishing an estimate for the services demand. So in 2012, the concept for the construction was finally finalised. You can see in the red hatched area, that's the declared rare flora. The breakwaters at the deepest point is 50 metres wide and 14 to 15 metres high. To put it in perspective, that's about a five-storey building. So the outcomes. 
We've achieved a community space where um, it accommodates events arranged by the community and clearly shows items from the wish list. The events consist of Blessing of the Fleet, the Anaconda Adventure Race and the Gourmet Escape. Whale watching charters have increased from two boats to five boats. This is because they've been, uh, been able to accommodate the safe boarding of passengers I previously mentioned that are using tenders from the Flinders Bay jetty. Augusta has a population of approximately 2,000 people and the whale watching brings in a lot of tourism which generates income for the community. The harbour foreshore path has a high level presentation throughout, sorry, shows a high level presentation that is throughout the harbour. Trees milled at the sand pit, sorry, trees removed from the sand pit were milled and used as decking and um, seating and tables. There's a plaza with picnic facilities. Um, stone from the quarry was used as feature walls and retaining walls. Seed collected from the site before it was cleared was propagated in the nursery and used to rehabilitate the adjacent vegetation. A water sensitive urban design principle was also used to, um, in the storm water management. It's a land back service wharf which enables fishermen to offload the catch after spending days out at sea, whereas previously they had to, to offload on the beach daily. Aquaculture. Um, the Ocean Grown Abalone OJ, which is now a public listed company since opening of Augusta Boat Harbour. They have 15,000 habitats or concrete blocks which form their ranches for the abalone to grow on in natural conditions. The boat harbour has enabled this growth. As previously mentioned, they were loading single blocks at a time and now have four vessels in boat pens. They utilise the land back wharf and have recently completed their building on site. There are 40 boat pens, majority occupied with a diverse range of commercial and recreational vessels. There's a universal access pontoon which enables mobility impaired people to access vessels. The breakwaters have public access, which allows for fishing, and it's also been designed with a parapet wall to prevent overtopping. This is also more expensive to do than normal. The pen holders amenities and toilet block has been designed to resemble a whale skeleton and has a stone wall feature from the quarry. There's four lanes in the boat launching facility which incorporates a jinker and hard stand for larger vessel maintenance. The emergency services are very happy. They now have a, place to, a base to operate from because of the very rough coastline. And there are some drawings that have re recently been submitted about the new building that they propose to build on site. And this is some of our friends that visited us during construction. So why was it a success? Um, this is some of the feedback received from the then Director General of Transport, Rhys Waldock, and from Dennis Meir, a former professional fisherman and commodore of the Augusta Boat Club. Yacht Club sorry. Okay, so to sum up why we think why it was a success is um, DOT clearly understood what the community wanted through their involvement every step of the way. <coughs> DOT delivered what the marina users said they needed and had a good understanding of the site, including its constraints and opportunities. The necessary funding was made available due to the community support. There was overwhelming community support and interest throughout the project. The boat harbour has now been in operation for four years and the community continue to totally, su be su sorry, to be to totally supportive. Um, just, if you look at there, that goes through the shell, just... Um, so that's where the quarry was, and the road there is, has an elevation about 20 metres higher than the harbour floor. There you go. Yeah, yeah it's done. We're going to have to fly through the uh, next sessions, but I want to thank uh, Jason. We, uh, we're probably going to be stuck for time for do questions, but I'll um, invite both Greg Britton and um, John Hogan up to us both speaking next, um, just to try and speed it along. Um, John Hogan's uh, well known in the industry, I don't need to give him an introduction, um, but uh, he's speaking first, followed by Greg Britton. Greg Britton's a director at uh, Royal Hascone, um and also um, He's currently Deputy Chairman of Pianc in New Zealand, so John, I'll get you to speak first. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm only going to talk about high-level um, marina design. I'm not going to get into the actual nuts and bolts of it. 
because uh, my co-speaker on the right here is much better at that than I am. Um, these are concepts as owners and managers of marinas that we see around the world that we think uh, are well worth your consideration. The place where we start is uh, sustainability. And in particular, in our part of the world, it's become pretty second nature, but in many places we go to, it's not. And that's why we prepared this book, Sustainable Marina Development. Usually, as you know, in sustainability, you have three items that you cover, your environmental, your economic, and your social responsibilities. We go into each one of those and what they mean in marina design. But the last one never really got a run. It's called destination protection. And if you stop and think about why we're there and what the assets are that are under our care, we have a particular responsibility to the community to be very good custodians of that land because it's the very reason you're there. And if you don't be a good custodian, not only are you letting the community down, but you're letting your own business down. So it's really important that these are the items that we uh, follow. The things I think that are most important when you're making a decision, greenfield versus brownfield sites. This is actually a critical decision because we're finding with increasing regulation, it's not uncommon for us to wait 5, 10, 15 years to have a site actually approved if it's a greenfield site. There are many cases like this, as you know, and it becomes very frustrating. You actually have investor fatigue. We often see investors selling their interest in a site five years in, they just give up. The other side of it, if you look at Brownfield, there are all kinds of assets on the waterfront that are in a dilapidated state. Uh, the industry changes, uh, fishing rules change, there are all kinds of them and they are crying out for new development and that's where our industry can really take on that history because the community doesn't really want to lose it and be able to capture that and incorporate it in your new story. The most important of call is the natural assets of the site. I always say if you wouldn't anchor your boat there for the night to sleep, don't bother building a marina there. Really simple concept, homegrown, but honestly, if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't anchor there, to think you can actually build enough infrastructure to ameliorate the problems to do with what's coming at you from Mother Nature, you will have a high maintenance facility for life, I promise you. And nobody wants a business with a high maintenance facility. Uh, we all know floating breakwaters can help, but not if it's a mongrel of a site, I wouldn't bother. It does have engineering rules beyond mongrel, right? But that's kind of, that'll do. That'll do. <laughs> Sedimentation, if you build in the right place, you may never have to dredge, dredge at all. If you build in the wrong place, you've got a job for life. And the most important thing, bums on seats. We need people that will come and spend money in these facilities. And don't think of boat owners only. There are many other opportunities for, to make this work. That would be alternative revenues. Your tenants are your most important partner in these developments. Uh, I know of a marina owner that put a people counter, standard practice on all of their marinas, and they did that so they could count how many people walked on the marina because when it comes time to negotiate with the tenant, you have a story to tell. Very simple thing to do. Birthing plans. You need to look at what your current structure are. There are many marinas with eight metre berths in them. It's a total waste of time. Honestly, you can't make money out of an eight metre berth, but you can reconfigure and turn that quite valuable, even using exactly the same pontoons. The next one is events. I'm seeing more and more professional event management in marinas. And this doesn't have to be done just with you. Like, you can hire somebody else that will run the event. They'll do it on a share basis. I think we underestimate how important the space is that we occupy on marinas. If you look at uh, Rybovich Marina in, Cal in Florida that was able to do the Ferrari California la launch, where they parked the Ferraris on, on the actual marina. It's a great story and it's something that's worthwhile looking at. And the last one are jet ski docks. The little jet ski docks that are so small, they're about four, four and a half metres by about one and a half. We're seeing a lot more marinas place these in the hard to get areas. In the dead water around the marina, you find people with tinnies and jet skis that want, just want somewhere to get it out of the water. 
The Southport Yacht Club uses this because they have a groundswell of people in apartments that just walk over the road. If you fly in from Auckland and you want to get on the water, you have a jet ski. Your return is under one and a half years on that investment. So it's a pretty good way of taking up vacant water. I think um, in all of these, what we've seen is that we are in this business for fun. We have uh, traditionally been a lifestyle business. There are many people that have built their family's livelihood on owning a marine business. And the thing that I've seen is that there's a professionalism entering the industry. We're seeing particularly from government and even city councils where it used to be, oh, well, we know you, you're, you're a local and you can do a good job for us. But increasingly those uh, governments are having to use external project management firms. And those external project management firms are paid in a totally different way to what the local government officer was paid. So we're seeing that you're having to professionalise your offering. So saying she'll be right, mate, when there's terms in the contract that are quite different to that, are meaning that as owners and as contractors, we have to be a lot more aware of our responsibilities. And so when it comes to marina design, there are many people that can help you. Uh, it's, a, it's an area not to be taken lightly. Uh, as a designer said to me once, pay 5% more on the front end and reap the benefits forevermore. All the best. Thanks. It's a, probably a good way to lead into Greg Britton. Uh, he's done a lot of marina um, design work. I'll hand over to Greg. Thanks, James. <clears throat> well, that's a good start. Hang on. <laughs> Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to speak to you this afternoon about PIANC, uh, which is an industry organisation uh, and in the context of the marina design theme. Uh, <clears throat> that'll be mostly in my role as uh, Deputy Chair of PIANC Australia and New Zealand, uh, but also towards the end more in a role of, uh, of a designer of marinas and boat harbours. So I'll talk a little bit about what is PIANC, because there might be a few people in the audience who don't understand what PIANC means and how is PIANC relevant to recreational boating and marinas generally, some specific relevance to marina design that PIANC offers, uh, how to become involved and derive benefit from being a member of PIANC if that's what you choose to do. Uh, then at the end, a little bit about PIANC's initiative on working with nature uh, and a local example of working with nature here in Australia, in New South Wales. Uh, so what is PIANC? Uh, PIANC is an acronym for the permanent International Association of Navigational Congresses. I'll say that a few times quickly. Um, it's something which uh, people understand are in the industry, but a lot of people find it hard to retain. So they've rebadged themselves a World Association for Waterborne Transport Infrastructure, which is still a bit of a mouthful, but at least it relates a little bit more to what, the, what we do. It was established in 1885, so it's been in place now for over 130 years. So it's probably doing something right in terms of a, an industry organisation. It is a leading partner for government and private sector in the design, development, maintenance of ports, waterways, coastal areas across the world. It's non-political and it's non-profit. So everyone involved in PIANC does it on a voluntary basis. Uh, the money that is income to PIANC via membership fees, via holding conferences and seminars and so forth, is reinvested to the benefit of its members. It brings together the best international experts on certain topics around technical economic, environmental issues associated with recreational boating and commercial shipping and the like. Uh, it produces high quality reports and this is probably one of the, the, the core business activities of PIANC and the value that it derives to its members. Uh, it holds major international conferences, it holds local seminars, it holds local networking events where people get together just over a beer to talk about recreational boating and, and shipping and the like. There's an Australia and New Zealand section uh, it's a very active section. It's one of 27 sections nationally worldwide. Uh, Australia punches a lot above its weight. We have the most number of uh, commercial uh, participants and membership of any nation, uh, national section in the world. So how does PIANC relate to marinas and recreational boating generally? There are four commissions within PIANC. 
there's an Inland Navigation Commission, a Maritime Navigation Commission, an Environmental Commission. These are all given acronyms. The most important one for this audience is a Recreational Navigation Commission, or RECCOM, uh, and it's connected to all the other networks uh, around the world in terms of recreational boating. Uh, there's a number of working groups that exist within each of these four commissions. It's a collection of experts from all the member nations, so you can have anyone from around the world participating in the working groups, all on a voluntary basis, and they're all acknowledged experts in their field. They prepare publications, and this, as I said earlier, is the core business of PIANC. It produces documents for the use of its members. At any one time, there could have been 15 to 20 working groups actively preparing working group reports, those publications are free for all PIANC members, uh, which, is, which is one of the major benefits of being a member of PIANC. The publications are used for general guidance and reference. They're not meant to replace a standard, so in our case 3962, it's not a replacement for 3962. There'll be always shell words in uh, the 3962 which are mandatory, but in many places there is information around should, there is information which gives the designer discretion, and this is where really PN documentation can be very valuable. So Australia and New Zealand, uh, we, we participate in a, a large number of working groups, but I'd have to say in the RECCOM Commission, we're probably underrepresented internationally uh, in participation of those working groups, and so one of the reasons for speaking to you today is to encourage membership of PN, encourage participation in working groups, uh, there is financial assistance available within PIANC for members to participate in those working groups. So international travel, most of these working group meetings are held in Europe or America. Uh, there's a, money's available up to about $2,000 per annum uh, to participate in those by making application as a member to the PIANC board. I've got a series of slides here which I won't read out, but this gives you some idea of the publications that PIANC have produced and continue to produce uh, listed since, say, 2000, related to RECCOM only. There's a whole raft of them related to those other commissions I mentioned. So marina service connections, recreation navigation, particularly with an emphasis on nature, this goes back to 2002. It's been a, very much a fundamental issue for PIANC in order to make sure people are designing with nature. Dredging, disability access, mooring systems, water quality, alternative materials, dry stack storage, super yachts, uh, prefabricated marina elements, sedimentation systems, or to prevent sedimentations, a raft of design guideline documents in many parts. To expand on some of the content of these working group papers, so super yachts, vessel characteristics, the facility planning and design guidelines, different berthing systems, the utilities and hardware associated with super yachts, operational guidelines and support services around dry stack storage, typologies and technologies around dry stack, the relevance of dry stack to boating infrastructure regionally, components and operational outline, <clears throat> general guidelines. These documents are very, very detailed and very extensive, as I say, free for all members. Some of the guidelines from Marina Design Part 4, uh, design approaches, surveys and investigation, vessel characteristics, marina protection, coastal aspects, so it goes on into materials, age, navigation, emergency equipment. And <clears throat> these are some of the ongoing working group topics that are in place. So these are active now, uh, and any member of PN can apply to be a member of the working group. Anyone in Australia gets very, very strong support from the Australian New Zealand Board in order to participate, because we want the documents to be relevant to what we do in Australia, we want them to be contemporary, uh, and therefore we encourage people to, to join as a member of working groups. So sustain, sustainability, big issue, John uh, mentioned, guidelines from wind design, some esoteric topics around acoustic imaging, mooring systems, fire systems, that's been a very much a topic yesterday and today I hear in the 3962. So this is not a unique problem to Australia, it's being handled by international experts worldwide. And I think there's much to be gained by sharing, you know, a problem shared is a problem halved. So how to become involved, there is a website um, you can visit, uh, you can attend functions, conferences, seminars, regional chapter meetings, there's a regional chapter in Queensland, New South Wales, all the states of Australia. 
consider joining, you can join as either a corporate member, an individual member, a student member. Uh, the cost is not great if you're a student, $50 a year. Uh, if you're an individual member, about $250 a year. If you're a corporate member, about $1,400 a year. And if you're a corporate member, every, every employee in your corporation automatically becomes a member and gets the opportunity to get all the working group documents free of charge. I mentioned Piang's initiative around working with nature. Um, so this is a, a mindset of a proactive, integrated approach to planning infrastructure that delivers benefits not only to the recreational boating community, uh, but to the environment. Uh, it involves developing you know, a, a detailed understanding of the environment and respect for the environment, meaningful stakeholder engagement, and preparing proposals and design that not only deliver the outcome for recreational boating, say, but also a lot of environmental and social benefit. I think gone are the days where you simply need to demonstrate that you don't have any adverse impact, you've got to demonstrate you're actually providing a net beneficial impact socially and environmentally. <clears throat> and on that score, just to finish off, an example of working with nature. Uh, for those of you who know it, um, Shell Cove, Boat Harbour and Marina on the south coast of New South Wales, about two hours drive south of Sydney. I'll put my designer's hat on here. Uh, this is a view of the partially completed development looking out over the breakwater and groin westwards towards the, the boat harbour development. So this is a, a dig out boat harbour, about 18 hectares of waterway created in the land behind the existing beach, about two kilometres of new foreshore, 250 berth marina, uh, 470 metre long breakwater, 280 metre long groin, over two million cubic metres of material shifted. Uh, and I've just listed down below on the left-hand side there uh, some of the working with nature themes. So the first one is compensatory wetland. So in this area of the Boat Harbour waterway, which you can see here uh, excavated in the dry, which I'll return to later, this was a former degraded swamp area uh, and a poorly regulated purchasable landfill. Uh, Notwithstanding that, the developer made the commitment to remove the protestable landfill, put it into an engineered cell and create playing fields. Uh, the degraded wetland, he said, well, why don't we go to a wetland which exists over in here uh, and we'll enhance and embellish that existing wetland and we won't start any civil works on this site until we can demonstrate through monitoring that that wetland that we've embellished is functioning ecologically. Uh, and that was a commitment to the extent that that was embodied in a development consent condition. So no work started on this site until this work was done, until the playing fields were created over here. Management of acid sulphate soils. Uh, so this area, uh, at the time when it was first designed as a boat harbour, uh, the designers put the area in the lowest part of the site, which made a lot of sense at the time because it minimised the amount of excavation volume. What they didn't realise back then, but this is an area of actual and potential acid sulphate soils, about 600,000 cubic metres of acid sulphate soils, uh, which would otherwise need management. So what was done in that um, sense was something very, very simple, but quite clever. Uh, it was a boat harbour plan form rotation. So the boat harbour was rotated about 15 degrees to the west. Uh, that did a couple of things. It about halved the acid sulphate soils total volume. So about 300,000 cubic metres of acid sulphate soils that no longer had to be excavated. At the same time, it created an area in a non-acid sulphate soil area which could be excavated and over-excavated for that acid sulphate soil material to be placed. So it unlocked the construction sequencing and the environmental consequences of the project as well. In the area where acid sulphate soils still existed, uh, which was in the east after the westward rotation, that area was capped and consolidated. The benefit of that was <clears throat> the capping reduced the amount of oxygen that could get down to the acid sulphate soils for their acidification. Uh, it consolidated some material down further below the water table, which is a benefit because that also limits oxidisation, <clears throat> and it improved capillary action, which keeps the acid sulphate soils moist and also uh, benefits oxidation. Then the acid sulphate soils that were taken out of this area here were reburied in the over-excavated over floor of the boat harbour. So the, the floor of the boat harbour is over-excavated up to about four to five metres. That was mostly in rock. 
that rock was also used for core material in the breakwater and for rock revetment construction. So all over is about two and a half million cubic metres of material in about six different material types that were completely reused on the site. Nothing, nothing left the site. Removal of a rock groin. There was previously in the design a rock groin through this area here and the view was that that had to be included uh, initially to retain this sandy beach through this area. Through a lot of numerical modelling and physical modelling, we took the view that that structure could be removed, uh, which saved money, but also saved rocky reef ecology through this area here in quite an important local surfing spot. Elimination of a flushing pump. Again, at the start, there'd been a view that in order to maintain satisfactory water quality within the boat harbour, there'd be a need to install a, a seawater pump here, pump water up to the top end uh, at the time of ebb tide flow in order to enhance flushing. Uh, our view was, <clears throat> with the controls that exist throughout the boat harbour catchment, which is very, very detailed, water-sensitive urban design, a lot of controls around the ability for that uh, marina activity to take place without introducing pollutants into the water column, uh, that we ought to be able to eliminate the flushing pump. And, uh, one minute? OK. Uh, and the benefit of that also was that in order to... What people didn't realise was in order to stop marine fouling of the pipe that was pumping seawater in to try and enhance tidal flushing, chlorine had to be introduced to limit that uh, issue, uh, in which case that was degrading water quality as part of the solution. So uh, our EPA in New South Wales agreed the elimination of the flushing pumps. There's no longer a flushing pump, which in addition saved a lot of capital costs, saved a lot of operating costs, as well as having the environmental benefit. Um, lastly, um, all this work has been undertaken in the dry. So this is excavation about nine metres below sea level, uh, completely in the dry, which has a number of benefits in terms of cost, in terms of schedule, in terms of environmental impact, uh, in terms of quality control on construction. That all came about uh, on the basis originally this was going to be dredged because of the acid sulphate soils issue. Part of the acid sulphate soils issue went away with the plan form rotation. But in addition to that, we did a lot of work to demonstrate that the rate of oxidation of the material to create the problem with the sulphuric acid uh, was such that there was, a, there was enough time to excavate, rebury and cap the material without having to do that material in the wet. Uh, and that was it. Thank you. Uh, we have to be quick because uh, we've got six topics in seven minutes for each topic. So uh, how anyone thought Darren Vaux would uh, keep his talk down to less than 30 minutes, I don't know. But anyway, we'll move on. Uh, I'll introduce uh, Corey from uh, Club Marine to come up and present the six speakers. Um, can everyone thank those three speakers, Jason, Greg and John?